So let's call to order the July 13 meeting of the Montpelier Planning Commission. The first thing we have to do is approve the agenda, which people receive through email. So if you'll take a look at that, please. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Okay. Moved by Barb. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second by Marcella. Okay. Those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Okay. Agenda approved. Uh, so, so the next thing on the agenda, or the next thing we're doing is uh, comments from the chair. Uh, so the update I have is uh, after last meeting, I'd asked everyone for some feedback about how they'd like to see things structured moving forward and going to the city plan. Uh, I have received a lot of really great feedback so far. Um, so if anyone hasn't, then please uh, pitch in because uh, most people have at this point. And I'll be compiling uh, what I've received for our next meeting and, and uh, talk about that try to bring bring back to the group sort of the you know compiled you know requests and 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 discussion materials and and figure out what we want to do one theme i can tell you that i've noticed so far is that it seems like most people are interested in reaching out to the public sooner rather than later when it comes to uh the city plan so that's definitely something that we'll probably talk about next time about ways we can do that um and we'll, we'll also be talking about some other things uh, as well. So the, the feedback was really great. So thanks, everybody. Uh, that's all I have for comments. Uh, so next up, we have general business. Is there anyone present from the public who would like to discuss an item that is not on the agenda? That is, would they like to discuss something that's not related to the design review district boundary, the design review uh, rule changes, uh, the Pioneer Street Zoning District change or, you know, the energy plan implementation. Anything else? Okay. Uh, so with that, we can move on to uh, considering the minutes from last time. So if, if everyone will take a look at those that were emailed out. Kirby, I have a question um, towards the end of the minutes. It says that you asked if the presentation could be sent out to be reviewed by the commission. I'm not sure what presentation that refers to. It was the presentation we'd received from Meredith before and just what other supporting materials. And Mike did do that um, for, our, for our materials tonight. Mike had sent a whole packet. I had also resent some materials, but... Um, a lot of what I sent actually was redundant with what Mike had already sent out when he sent out the agenda for this week. So this is the information that was sent out, not a specific presentation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that was a, that was a request that, that Mike did and that we have now. Do we have a uh, motion to approve the minutes? I'll move to approve the minutes. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Second by Barb. Okay, those in favor of approving the minutes from June 22nd, say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Okay, minutes approved. And now we get to what we're here for tonight, which is the final public hearing on uh, some zoning changes. Uh, 
And the, the first item we need to discuss is the design review district boundary, which is what we will propose for the city council, for the city council to change. And uh, also changes to the design review rules. Um, as a bit of background, uh, this is something that has been worked on, that, that, that we have worked on since last fall, um, starting in September. Uh, and into the spring and then uh, we were hoping that it would be done by now but of course it was interrupted by covid uh, and uh, the changes in the how we were conducting our meetings but now we have finally gotten to this hearing um, this is not the only hearing we did actually hold a public hearing previously on this uh, which i'm really glad we did at this point because uh, i wouldn't feel good if our only public hearing was by zoom um, but we, we did have that one public hearing before. We have had a lot of public meetings of the Planning Commission where we discussed this. Uh, but, you know, that's about it for the background. It has been a while since we've discussed this. So I think we're, some of us will probably be rusty about some of the, the things that were discussed and some of the decisions that were made many months ago. Uh, but with that, I could turn it over to Meredith to walk us through where we last were. Are you able to do that for us, Meredith? Ooh, well, I thought I was here for questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I can jump in to just go through and say, sure. this will really depend on how much input and how many questions you guys are going to have on this. Um, we've, other than someone who may be watching this on Orca or in, 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 in watching it on tape later on, <laughs> There's nobody here to provide input. So the amount of discussion that you want to have, I can go through and summarize um, what the design review rules are. Um, but really, it's going to be up to you guys how much and how long we want to talk about the design review rules. As you point out, it's been talked about a lot within the group. We've had a couple public hearings on it. Um, but uh, I could roll out a quick summary and you know, uh, if, if we had if we had members of the public who were interested, I know the, the, the one person here who is who um, is is Brooke, she's here for Pioneer Street. So we don't really have somebody on the line who is going to be, you know, giving a presentation to and then they can respond with their questions and comments. So it's up to you guys how much you want me to present on this um, and how much you want to kind of keep it short and move move on to Pioneer Street. Yeah, and I mean, I, I can give sort of a presentation on the process, but it's also talking about where you left off last. I'm not sure I was even, was I even at the last public, you know, planning commission meeting on this? I honestly can't remember because I had been so entrenched in other things. Um, and I don't think it said in here when your last meeting was on it. Um, sure. So oh. uh, how, about, how about we, how about this? How about, uh, you know, Meredith, run through the the you know 30,000 foot view for a, a couple of minutes and then Mike can tell us about the last decisions that were made and go from there yeah that sounds good um so big picture overview and um you know this is probably largely for people at home um, who are viewing via orca um is that um you know, the I, I staff the Historic Preservation Commission and which we like to call the HPC. So the HPC took up the task of drafting new design review regulations back in September of 2017 um, because concerns were identified about how the design review regulations were framed um, when the unified, the general unified development regulations were being rewritten. Um, in 2017 and into 2018. So um, part of the, the HPC's process was to look at example design review regulations from other Vermont towns as well as nationwide. They were just doing a big, let's look at everything and try and create a whole new system if need be. Um, they looked at the rehabilitation best practices from the National Park Service and the American Planning Association. They hired a consultant to give them guidance on, on where, which direction to go and big picture ideas. 
Um, and then, of course, the expertise of the Historic Planning Commission members themselves, many of whom are full-time professionals in the historic preservation field. Um, so the, the HPC's drafting goals and intentions were to improve the predictability and consistency of applications when they came in the door um, and for the applicants themselves. So the consistency of, of their, their approach to the application process for design review. Um, to improve the defensibility of the city's decisions, permit decisions on design review, because right now the current regulations are very sparse. They're you know, set specific of number of guidelines, but really nothing to hang your hat on if somebody appeals a decision. Um, they, the Historic Preservation Commission decided to continue with a design review district versus they could have opted to go strictly to a historic review district, which has different parameters and would have to be just the historic district boundaries, but they went with design review overlay, design review district, so that can be a much broader part section of the city. Um, they also, one of the, the mandates was they had to, um, uh, sorry, so they also wanted to have um, more flexible design standards versus the current regulations with clear um, exemptions and options for administrative officer review. So that's an entirely new, new item. Um, sorry, one second. Um, they also, I just lost my presentation, um, had to meet the certified local government requirements for the design review regulations. Um, so that the, the design review process results in projects that are more consistent with the National Park Service Rehabilitation Standards. So that's something that they had to do. So some of the changes that were made are just, they're mandated because the city of Montpelier is a certified local government. Um, and if we don't keep up those, that, those requirements, then we lose options for grant funding. Um, and then finally, the, the final goal was to make sure that the guidelines are really transparent. Um, and to enable discussion of revisions to the overlay district boundaries, which is the other part of this process that you're looking that the plan commission is looking at. Um, so the really the, the there's no way to run a direct red line between what we currently have and the new proposal because so much of the language was changed. But there are really three core categories of changes that have happened. Um, one specific standards were set were added um, for alterations and additions to historic buildings versus projects that don't involve historic buildings. Right now, there's just some guidelines, they apply to everything. That doesn't really make sense when you have such a mix of historic buildings and non-historic buildings in the design review district. Um, so they've broken those out so that stricter standards apply to historic buildings and non-historic buildings have some more flexibility. Um, additionally, the application process was clarified within the design review regulations with options for administrative officer approval. Right now, that's not in the regulations at all. Everything that comes up in the design review district has to go through the design review committee. Um, and so things like, you know, changing the color of a building that has already been painted previously, that's no longer going to have to go through the design review. So that's one of those, um, actually that might be an exemption, not just administrative officer approval, but some things will be administratively approved at this point. And then increased exemptions from design review and clarifying some statutory limitations, um, just so that there's consistent application of these regulations going forward and you don't have as many things open to interpretation by a zoning administrator. Um, Mike, you said you were going to talk about specific changes, right? Um, yeah, I can jump in. I mean, that gives an, an overview with, without getting into the specifics of what all the, the smaller changes are that are in there. But, um, you know, I can jump in just to, to, to go to the boundary changes. So that kind of gives an overview of what was changed to the rules, which is pretty much everything. We took the old rules, which had a number of issues, um, and they'll be replaced with a new set of rules that tries to add more detail 
So that way applicants and reviewers have more information to make better, better decisions. Ones that can be, that can stand up at the court. There's been some Vermont Supreme court decisions um, that require that we have more specificity in our rules. And so we really have been delinquent in, in not getting these updated. So this will help fix that, that legal issue. But then we also set up processes where these can be more efficient. So you don't have to go to the DRB to remove a sign. Right now you do. Um, this would become an administrative permit. So we can do a couple of these things a lot easier. Um, and then from a, a map standpoint, we wanted to have a basis in our map that wasn't just arbitrary. And really our current design review boundary was, was, was arbitrary. In fact, it didn't even follow parcel lines in some cases. So um, part of a parcel would be in and part of a parcel wouldn't be. And what we tried to do was follow parcel lines, try to match them to neighborhood boundaries as much as possible, and then just to clean up the map in a number of places. Um, there were certain rules we had to follow the designated downtown. Everything in the designated downtown must be in design review. So that, that's one rule. And um, beyond that, we just tried to follow some, make some logical things um, uh, where, we, where we followed on neighborhood lines. So most of the changes are rather subtle. That's on the map that you, that you had and that's available online. Um, if you have that map, if you're at home and you're looking at the map, it can be a little bit confusing. There's uh, a red hatched line and there's a solid black line. The solid black line is the existing boundary and the red hatched line is what the new boundary would look like. So there's, you can see just a couple of places where a parcel is added or a parcel is removed. And that's, those are really what we're looking at in this amendment is to go through. And there's also a few subtle zoning changes, zoning district changes that were done to match this as well. Um, there'd be a couple of three properties on Terrace Street and I think one on Barry Street where the zoning district actually changed just to, just to clean up the map a little bit. So that's a, a summary of most of the map changes. Um, we did not go through and make large scale changes. We talked about those, but uh, eventually felt we would make modest changes at this point to clean it up. And if in the future we felt there were other adjustments that were needed, we can go back and revise that to add parcels in or remove other parcels. But that's the, that is the, the 10 minute summary of the design review changes. And so Mike, can you remind us where we left Bailey Avenue? I'm looking at, at the, uh, the map that you sent out. Um, and it, it seems like, so, so the history and the context for why I'm asking this question is that at a previous uh, hearing on this, we, we got feedback from some um, members of the neighborhood around Bailey Avenue about um, being removed or, or they were concerned about our proposed inclusion of a part of Bailey Avenue in, uh, in, in the new uh, design review boundary, whereas they, they weren't in before. Um, so I haven't done this before, but let me see if I can share my screen. And if you have problems, Mike, I can do mine. Uh, Wasn't some it reason, just that one property that juts up? I, we yeah we, dis we discussed removing some, and I'm not sure yeah. if the map reflects it right now. So this, let me yeah. see if I can zoom in a little bit. Yeah. So here's the, the, here's what Kirby's talking about. We've got State Street. If you had my little hand coming across State Street, we've got the Capitol sitting right here. Um, and moving, see if I can find it, right up through, through here is Bailey. Mm -hmm. And here is Baldwin. And then it turns and it goes up to Terra Street. So remember I mentioned before the red hash lines are what would be in the new district. The black solid line is the line of the current rules. So these properties would be added, including the redstone, this is the redstone building, would be added into design review new 
under the version that we had a hearing in January on, one, two, three properties here were also in. And we voted at that meeting to say they would not be, and they would be removed from design review. And we also rezoned them to be part of this blue neighborhood, the residential 9,000. So they would be rezoned as well in this proposal. Um, okay. So, so that was, that was map, one set of discussions. We did hear from some people who, I think a person who lived up here who was concerned about being uh, you know, kind of singled out. But it turns out this red line, where, where this is following through here, is in fact the historic district boundary. So everything in here is within the historic district, uh, National Register Historic District, and these other ones are out. And that's why that neighborhood line was drawn where it was, and that was why you in January had voted to keep this in. So, so right now, the, the proposal, the proposed map we're looking at, it follows the historic boundary. It, um, In uh, this I, area, yes. And does it also follow the zoning neighborhood boundary? It does. You'll notice the orange is one neighborhood boundary. The blue, the light blue is another neighborhood boundary. And it's hard to tell. It's kind of a red color that's behind this one. So this is um, a Ooh, I don't have off the top of my head the zoning of that one, but um, that's probably residential 3,000 maybe? Or residential 6,000. Yeah, that must be residential 6,000. This is mixed use residential. So it's following the, it, it doesn't follow the mixed use residential or else it would keep going, but it does follow um, to a point. Um, that boundary and then keeps going up through here and across behind the urban center one, there's some more mixed use. So you can see it's following those neighborhood lines. This goes into the Cliff Street area because that's actually part of the designated downtown. That's why there's an exception there. It follows the, again, zoning district line up through here. Again, this does not follow, this does not bring in the rest of this mixed use residential neighborhood, but follows Spring Street in the same as it does today. Um, a parcel was put in here. We remember we had a discussion up here. So now we're up by um, Main Street. So this is part of a parcel here. So under the old zoning, Half the parcel was in design review and half the parcel was out and we voted to put it in. So that way it now follows the parcel lines and we remove these few over here. And this is out by the school, by the way, that um, made a few, you know, a little parcel comes out, a little parcel comes in, you know, the rest of it are mostly just minor little tweaks, a little bit of, um, Downing Street was added in, the rest of Downing Street, the rest of these parcels, these parcels were all split in half. We just continued to reflect that the whole parcels would be in. The rest of Barry Street was added in because it's all part of the designated downtown and had to be put in. So that's, um, you'll see these guys up here. We removed CCV, this is the college campus. So the college campus stays in design review but the private parcels have been removed. So that those were the changes there. Um, just cleaning up, this is Northfield Street. Uh, we added in uh, what we call the gasoline alley down here. Right now it currently splits it in half. So some of the gas stations are in design review and half the gas stations are out. Well, we figured we would put them all in. That was what we voted on in January. Then we just clean these up to follow parcel lines. So most of this isn't very exciting through here. Um, so that's a quick scan of what was what was there. Now let's see if I can get us back out. You are sharing screen. Stop sharing. There we go. Anybody else have any questions for Mike about the boundaries? or Meredith for about the rules. Okay. 
Okay. It seems it seems like everything reflects, you know, where we left it last time and it felt like we were in a pretty good place last time. So just... Do you wanna vote these separately and just entertain this one now and then move on to Pioneer Street? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I, I, there's, I don't see any reason to combine the two. Um, okay, well let's let's do let's do. I mean, what do you think, Mike? Should we should we do the rule separately from the boundary? I don't think so. I think we'd be okay voting them both together. Okay. Well, uh, okay. So, uh, does ever does anyone have a motion for voting on the uh, rules and the boundary? For design review, I move to approve the design review rules and associated boundaries. I have a question, clarifying question. Do we need to move that we like the next step is to send it to city council, right? So, do we need to add that in as a step, or is that a given? Probably, probably a good idea to to approve these and forward them to city council for consideration. With our like recommendation. Yeah, I, I probably should have asked a leading question. I probably should have said something like, do we, do we have a motion to refer the boundary and rules as discussed uh, tonight uh, onto city council for their approval with our recommendation for them to adopt them? So moved. <laughs> Is that different than what Aaron had already pre presented? <laughs> so okay, we need somebody. Okay, <clears throat> so we've got that. Then, then um, Aaron's motion dies for fail of a second, and we can take Barb's motion as it stands. How's that? Which okay. was actually really Kirby's wording, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's. I should remember to ask leading questions more often. Okay, so uh, do we have a second for Barb? Okay. Okay, Aaron seconds. Those in favor of Barb's motion, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So, with, uh, I think that was a 5 0 approval with uh, Stephanie and John aren't present at the moment. Who is John? He's this guy we used to see around. Now he was supposed to come tonight. Oh. Something may have come. Up. <laughs> this this member that supposedly saw around before. <laughs> he may have gotten messed up because the second Monday of the month fell at an awkward time. I I don't know. And again, I don't know. Okay. So it looks like we've we that 5-0. So uh, I thought that would take longer. Um, Mike had the wisdom to include another item on our agenda, so we can actually... Oh, we still got Pioneer Street. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, see, that makes more sense. Um, and that probably caused Brooke to panic for a second there. I don't know um, if she was paying attention. Okay, well, let's talk about Pioneer Street then. Um, Mike, do you want to... Remind us about that, or I can give it a go. Uh, yeah, or I can I can share my screen again. Let's see if I can get the second one to come up here. Uh, let me go back to here really quick. Turn that one off. Okay, so uh, just to orient everybody, uh, this is the Pioneer Street Bridge as it turns um, Sabin's Pasture up top and River Street kind of going along through here. Um, this is the car wash. This is Montpelier Flagworks. 
So hopefully that gives everybody a little bit of orientation. Um, this is heading down towards the roundabout and uh, the, the Ford dealership and the Grossman's property. This is the Ford dealership. This is the Grossman, old Grossman's property. Um, and the Winooski River cutting through here. So, uh, and what we are looking at specifically today is um, some proposals for the Pioneer Street area, which includes um, the self-store units. There's um, that are kind of along the roadway and along the river. There's a railroad bed that bisects the property um, and the car wash. And this property also includes the insurance companies and the um, uh, bare naked growler and the um, medical marijuana facility. So those are all on this same parcel. It's a large parcel, has a number of buildings. Um, they were looking to do an expansion and it was discovered that most of the, many of the uses and almost every building are considered non-conforming under the new zoning. So a question came up, they would all be conforming if they were in this purple district, which is Eastern Gateway but they're not, they're part of the orange district over here, which is Riverfront. And so the question came up as to whether or not this is or was properly zoned and whether we should consider merging it with this zoning district and changing it to Eastern Gateway to make these all conforming uses. Um, this small patch up top is land that's on the other side of the river and we would simply be changing that zoning designation to be um, rural. So if you're wondering what the yellow hatch is, that's all city owned land, parts of the river. Um, it's old country club road basically. And it would just be rezoned part of rural. But this part here is really the, the topic of discussion, which is what are we going to do with uh, the Pioneer Street, which is really two parcels, the parcel that, um, you heard from at the last meeting and the car wash property, both of which in this proposal would be shifted to Eastern Gateway to make them conforming and be able to change. The argument on the other side um, is that if we wanted to see these properties change over time to be um, more pedestrian oriented and not to continue to develop as um, auto oriented, which Eastern Gateway is kind of recognized that it is more auto oriented. There are less sidewalks or no sidewalks in these areas. Most of the buildings are designed with large parking lots to accommodate people driving in with vehicles. So the question is, if our goal is to force this area to change into the future, then you would keep it as a riverfront district. Um, but that would have uh, consequences for the property owners, or you can go the other way. So that's kind of laying out both sides. There's a little bit, um, I can answer any questions that people have, but that's pretty much what you have. Mike, what is the section, the yellow section? Um, what zoning is that it, across the street? So all of this was, so all of the outside of these crosshatch areas were all or are today zoned riverfront. When, yeah, I mean, we <laughs> when we decided to cut these out, we sliced right down the middle of the river and said everything from the middle of the river south will, in this proposal, shift to Eastern Gateway. Everything from the center of the river north would be shifted to rural. Right, I'm, I'm interested in what the zoning is for nine, is it 9-5 nine across, um, the street oh, from our part. proposal. Yes. Yes, that's a residential three three thousand. So wow. those, mostly these these are these little roads that shoot up the hill. Yeah. Scribner Street. Oh, is it Taplin and 
I should have them written down there. So, um, it's Taplin Blackwell. Yes, yes Taplin Back Blackwell and Scribner. Yeah, Scribner's on the over here <coughs> uh, on the other side of Pioneer. Yeah, that's Scribner. So these these are all all have little small smallish houses, all residential. There's no commercial development in here, which is why it's been specially cut out as its own district. Thanks. That's helpful. Yeah, and there is a sidewalk on this side of the street. There is not a sidewalk on that side of the street. <sighs> and I'll point out that um, Brooke is here, Brooke Dingledine, who was the attorney that was representing the owners of this parcel. She is also on the line if you want to hear from her. Um, I don't know what process you want to use, Kirby. Yeah, I think now's a good time for, before the Planning Commission dives into any kind of policy we're in a discussion to ask Brooke if she would like to add anything, um, but, you know, no pressure to do so. Are you there, Brooke? I am. Uh, let me see if I can get the video. Great. I am here with Jim Barrett and his son, Kelly. Um, we didn't want to bore you with any other details, but did want to just remind you folks um, or answer any questions that you might have regarding um, the request that we had um, asked for. In looking at the uh, charts of the uses in the riverfront district that we've been placed into um, versus Eastern Gateway, there are a couple differences um, between the uses that are permitted or um, conditional uses in the area. But what we're talking about here is our building, well, in 1970, I believe, is when um, Mr. Barrett purchased the property, yes. when he purchased the property. And it was quite a, um, a, a dump <laughs> to, to use the vernacular. They did a lot of improvements to this property over the years. There were all sorts of uh, uh, building foundations and it was quite a, a place that was left in a disarray that really over the years, the Barretts have managed to really improve that property. Now, uh, there are 13 total buildings on the section that is under consideration for being placed into Eastern Gateway. 10 of those 13 buildings have been made non-conforming uses that are in violation of the ordinance uh, where in the future one could not build those kinds of buildings or have those kinds of uses. It's the self-storage units. There are nine of them, nine buildings on the property out of 12 that's on the Barrett's property. And then of course the car wash would be made non-compliant with or is now non-compliant in the riverfront district whereas the eastern gateway it would be permitted and that was one of the uses that would be in the gateway um, division or district so by the change that occurred it placed 10 of 13 buildings on the this area out of compliance with the statute now normally changes in zoning are enacted um, you know for those planning processes of directing how we want our orderly development to unfold into the future um, what we tried to explain to you last time was that these buildings aren't going to go anywhere um, they will be maintained they've been there for a, a long time and the whole notion was uh, there was another building that was going to be proposed and then it was discovered um, that the zoning had changed. My, my folks were not aware of that when the change was made recently. So that's why they're, they're coming to ask for a correction. I think that this, um, while well, it may have sounded like a good place to make the demarcation between Riverfront and the Eastern Gateway, it ends up um, creating a situation that really going to have the intended effect of rezoning this district to a, to different uses 
because this is a, a company that's been in you know, three generations, a hundred years, and uh, for the many, many years into the future, they'll be these buildings will remain, and so um, and they are vital to the use of many, many people in the Montpelier community or the Montpelier Barry community. As we explained last time, there are electricians who have uh, units. They come daily to get their supplies, to carry on their businesses, <coughs> office files, etc. I won't continue to bore you with that. But we really felt that um, we're sorry that we were not involved earlier on when the change was made. But given the consequences here, and also, you know, if you look at that map, Eastern Gateway is on the left-hand side once you reach the Barrett property. And so while there is then the yellow that shows residential, before you get to those uh, streets that go up into the residential uh, buildings, Green Mountain Power has um, infrastructure facilities there. Um, so it's not as if this, these are a bunch of, um, you know, that it's residential throughout that entire district. Um, the other thing is that all of these property, these buildings are really well kept. You can't see most of them as you go along because of the, um, the growth of the you know, leaf on conditions right now. I was driving it the other day and took a couple um, ganders and I see a, a roof of the building here and there. So all we're asking is that the zoning um, line just be moved to Pioneer Street, which makes more sense anyway, being, being an actual street division. And um, so that we can remain in compliance. There were plans to do one more building and the Barretts are perfectly fine in terms of applying for that if it were under Eastern Gateway with all the conditions that could be imposed, the aesthetic screening, planting of a buffer trees that would enhance the, um, the appearance for that gateway area as people come into Montpelier. So Mr. Barrett is here. He's able to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and again, we're sorry we were not involved in this earlier. And we're just hoping to get a correction here that really makes sense in terms of the reality. Um, and we don't feel like the change that was made really will be accomplishing maybe what was in originally uh, intended. So any questions that you have about the property or any of the buildings when they were built, um, Jim can certainly speak to any of that. Thanks very much. Does anyone have a question? Yeah, hi, this is, this is Darren Kosicki. Two questions. The first one is, is, I think I remember the last time we spoke with you, uh, Brooke, you had indicated that Mr. Barrett had tried in the past to sell the property and there was no buyers. Um, first question is, is, is that, I mean, do I remember that correctly? And the second question is, is if so, uh, does Mr. Barrett intend to continue to try to sell the property going forward? I'll turn it over to him in just a minute. What I understand is that he was specifically referring to the area uh, where there's parking now, which is the intended location of the last building that they were going to place there, the one they the last one they want to do that they weren't able to. Um, that parking lot area up near the street, for many, many years, there have been attempts to list it, try to find a buyer for it, et cetera, which has never come to fruition. Um, but I will let Mr. Barrett then tell you any more information that he remembers. Good evening, folks. Uh, Brooke has pretty much uh, said what we, uh, my son and I, uh, uh, follow what she said. Uh, we bought the property in 1970 with a lot of the old Green Mountain Power superstructure there, tank farms, etc. The most recent tank farm that we undercovered was an 80,000 gallon uh, oil tank, which of course we had to dispose of. As a matter of fact, the contractor to dispose of it was Phil Scott. 
And uh, <clears throat> over the years, uh, that particular piece, or you can build on that, that's about the only place left we can build on, uh, has had seven or eight automobile sales there and service uh, facilities, been a bar and, bar and nightclub, warehouses, and these are these are, are, uh, are uh, non-permitted uses now, and they're the only people that we could really sell to. Um, there's not going to be a bank there, obviously, or maybe you don't feel that way, but um, I think we've had every uh, every um, broker in the state of Vermont listing that that uh, parking lot. And the only time we had any interest over the years has been one of the Dollar General stores. And they found out that it wasn't quite big enough for them. Um, but it was a, it was a, as Brooke characterized it, as a dump. It was worse than a dump. We spent $75,000 dynamiting these structures, concrete structures that held oil tanks, big oil tanks. There was three of them there, so six in all. Uh, that uh, 80,000 gallon oil tank that was buried. Uh, I don't remember exactly how much that cost because the state did contribute something to that. And, uh, but there's still a lot of money and it's, uh, uh, it's a pain in the neck, although, although it's gone. It's, no, it's not gone. They filled it with concrete. Uh, that's, that's about. Mr. Barrett, you're not talking about any plans to sell the property now. Your, your plans are to do one la the last building that you had planned on for storage, mini storage? Yes, that's correct. We have mini storage all over the county. Uh, Can you hear him okay? Since he's away from the mic. Yeah, I can. Okay. Uh, and the answer to what you just characterized as uh, selling now, no. Uh, at the time we were trying to sell it, I was alone in the business. Now I've got uh, two sons that work there, Ellie and Patrick, and my uh, daughter is going to be, uh, she's just retired from teaching, and she'll be there in a couple of months. So it is a family business, has been from day one. Uh, and we've uh, we continued to build storage units because they are the highest and best use of this property. And uh, to us, especially after being uh, involved in it, uh, is the bottom line as far as we're concerned. It it's not saleable. However, we are going to rent it if it's vacant. We are going to rent it to Freddie Bashera to park cars whenever they get their permits to build down there by the Unitarian Church and so forth. They they have a, a use for uh, our parking lot, which is the only one left in Montpelier, but it's quite a ways away to be uh, useful for, for cars. But under the circumstances, he figures they're going to have 150 cars a month that they have to move back and forth, and it will take care of most of it. And that's that's actually the best. <laughs> if he ever gets the permits, that's actually the best use that we've ever had for it. That, that's come closely to fruition. <clears throat> so, Mr. Gardner, if the tanks are recommended to the city council. To change the Brooke, I, I'm sorry, I can't hear what you're saying. Yeah, we can't hear you, Brooke. What I'm asking, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. What I'm asking, Mr. Barrett, is if we got, if you folks changed the zoning and it got went through the city council, would he be planning on doing that additional building? Um, and if so, would he be willing to comply with all of the aesthetic buffering? and other conditions that that the conditional use permit would require. Yeah, we will. 
Did you hear? Did yeah, you hear yes. <laughs> he said yes. Did you hear? I've, I've got a couple of short questions, I hope. So you're saying that it is a parking lot now that you've spoken about with the Basharas to potentially rent. So even if we changed the zoning, you wouldn't necessarily build on that site. Is that correct? If you change the zoning, it wouldn't necessarily what? Build on that site. If you if were planning to use it. If they're changing the zoning, will you change? Will you build the building? Or are you going to now rent it to Freddie Bashera for parking? Well, that's only temporary while he builds his building. Oh, that was a temporary thing while the buildings were being uh, built. They were okay. In, they were inquiring about that. And then the other question I had was: so this property is a single lot? Is that correct? In other um, words, it can't be subdivided without going through, um, you know, regulations, through review. Is it a single lot? We purchased it from uh, Green Mountain Power as a single lot, but I, I sold to the, the car wash down there. Mm. And I think uh, over the years, I think that we're not subject to Act 250. I think we've cleared that up. Have you ever subdivided the property that you own into different lots, or is it one? No, it's all one. one. We pay taxes to the city uh, in a group all together. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, it may legally be two parcels because of the railroad. Um, mm. Under Vermont law, there's some distinction between if, if, if a road divides a property, it's considered a natural subdivision. So the railroad may also constitute and follow that same rule that even though he owns one parcel, even though he pays taxes once, um, that it, because it's a naturally subdivided parcel by the right of, by the railroad, it may technically be two, but. You, you may be right, I don't know, but we've never had any problem dealing with the railroad or the state. We do. That's right. um, Kelly says that his when he pays the bill, it's what it says it's one property. Yeah, yeah, they merged. It's merged for assessing purposes, but may technically be separate. But it, that would that was one we would probably run by our attorney because it's a railroad and not a, a road. We'd have to just see what an attorney would say. But <laughs> answers maybe. Yeah. Um, so, I, so I have a question. It was it was one that came up last time, but I just uh, I'd like to ask again to, to make sure that I got this straight. Um, would uh, would would you be all right if instead of changing the zoning district to make it Eastern Gateway, if we simply amended the four three district to allow storage units? Sure, that would be fine. I mean, yeah. So. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll use that as a segue into like, you know, some of my concerns and that would be that for one thing, I think there's a little bit of a spot zoning concern here. It's, I, I don't tend to get that worked up about spot zoning stuff, but I mean, this just, it does seem like we're changing the zoning for one particular parcel for one particular issue. And it's, it's at least around that territory in my mind, but I, I would feel like there would be less of a concern if we made a change that instead of just changing the zoning completely if we just acknowledged a certain prevailing use was happening and made that allowable going forward that would seem like uh just a more above board and and, and policy supported change um because i i have to, i gotta say that you know i see zoning as forward looking and we understand how it's been used and how and how the parcel could be used in the near future. But by changing it to Eastern Gateway, uh, you know, that zoning district is the most permissive when it comes to heavy industrial use or like at least by Montpelier standards, what would be heavy industrial use and also, you know, car dealerships and other, you know, the, the most industrial type of, of uses. And so the concern being it. It's, it's right up there near Berry Street that to, to move the industrial uses that close to the downtown does seem to be at odds with a lot of what happened in the zoning last time. Um, 
So you put that together with the spot zoning concern. So I'm, I, I'm wondering if, if um, a less severe, you know, solution was possible here. And I see Barb has her hand up. What do you have to say, Barb? I'm actually asking you, Kirby. So are you saying that the would modify the entire riverfront district then to allow for self-storage units specifically? Yes. Second that question. <laughs> Okay. Um, or is it just that neighborhood, which, you know, then it does sound like kind of spot zoning. Um, so my understanding is that it's currently in something called the route Two neighborhood or, and I, I don't, I don't mean just that neighborhood. I, I mean, um, you know, whatever category that neighborhood's in, uh, I don't. I don't know. I actually, I don't know. That's up for discussion. I don't. I don't actually have a strong thought about that. Um, and I think, you know, one issue that could come up would be um, how much um, of a parcel you need to allow storage units. So those are things we'd have to hammer out. Um, I was just hoping to ask the property owner if that's a solution that they they could also like an avenue they'd be interested in. And also want to know what the planning commission thinks about that as an alternative. I'll, I'll respond just by saying whichever works. Um, I, of course, the immediate response I had in looking at this was, oh gosh, we have to avoid any spot zoning. But I think there are a couple things here. One is um, this is a result of a very recent change, which unfortunately, um, Mr. Barry didn't have the opportunity to come and speak to when you were going through the process. Secondarily, this seems very similar to what's going on over in Bailey Avenue, the other side of town. It's about, gosh, this is where we drew the line and maybe that's not the right place. I think that that is less spot zoning than changing your criteria, but if changing, you know, the mini storage thing in the Eastern Gateway to a conditional use, which I would recommend instead of a permitted use, that way you still have control over it and it is limited to just the purple, including what would be what the Barrett and the auto uh, washing place, you know, it just extends that boundary just for that section. It's not one parcel. It's Barrett's, and it's the uh, and it's the um, the car wash. Um, so it's not about one specific parcel or property in terms of spot zoning. But I see this as a correction, similar to what's going on in the other side of town. That it makes more sense to stop the district at a road where there is an actual natural boundary, if you will. Um, it seems to me to be, uh, given the, the fact that these are properties that are developed the way that they are, um, it makes sense. Now, this isn't about trying to trick anyone into, oh gosh, we're gonna go build a car dealership if you change where the boundary is. Um, you know, They've owned the property a long time and that's never happened. But I totally understand and appreciate your concerns on spot zoning. Um, so whichever way that it that it suits you folks, my assumption would be changing that boundary would be much less onerous um, with other unintended consequences. That's my thought. Yeah, and, and and to clarify, I mean, like my concerns about the use of it in the future are not about like it's not about not trusting Mr. Barrett or not trusting anybody or thinking that you know the worst is going to happen or anything. It's just about kind of knowing about how like, 20 years down the road things happen with zoning that people didn't think about or intend and then and in this case i mean again the eastern gateway is very permissive so who knows what sort of pandora's box this could end up being 20 years from now and again i keep saying it's in my view walkable to downtown so i think it's like an area of a special concern for us um that said mike uh What's what's the plausibility of of making a surgical change having to do with storage units as opposed to an entire you know zoning district change? So the consequences 
probably the biggest consequence if you were to leave this in Riverfront and simply add Riverfront as a use. And, and uh, we talked about this a little bit as to, you know, there were two ways you could approach this. The changing that would then allow, um, allow self-store units into more of the downtown area. So there's a vacant parcel on Granite Shed Lane that could then be open to self-store units. Um, parts of Sabin's Pasture could have self-store units or, um, so it could come in as a use in a number of places that perhaps today, you know, we don't have them. There, there is some precedent though in, in in the regulations about having neighborhood specific uses, right? Because I noticed the Eastern Gateway actually had some of those where uh, you know, stuff like uh, automobile shops are allowed to orient their uh, the, um, the opening toward the road, but only in Eastern Gateway. That's, uh, that's a zoning district, not neighborhood. So there's neighborhoods within each district. So which are you talking about? Well, either one. I, I mean, I'm, you know, if, 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 if that's if that's not, I mean, I'll stand corrected if that's not true for any of our neighborhoods. Wait, wait, would it help if I pulled up the map? You can, uh, I mean, the I zoning map itself? Yeah, I mean, I can pull, if anybody wants it, I can pull up the zoning map so we can have us just see what all of Riverfront is right now, what we're talking about, because we can't, the, the use table is specific to the zoning districts, not neighborhoods, so we can't apply the warehouse warehouse use to a small part of the zoning district it has to be the entire zoning district okay so okay so and my question was basically is there any precedent for having a slightly different variation of rules for one neighborhood and you're saying no not for, there, not for uses there well there is there is a precedent in the zoning which which we didn't like but ended up being that way which, which was which involved the crossroads neighborhood what we call gasoline alley and that allows gas stations but the rest of riverfront does not allow gas stations where's that i think it's i think it's a footnote oh that has not come up in my two years i've been here so Yes, yeah, so that was a footnote that was put in. I wanted to have that be its own zoning district. It didn't work out that way. We took the victories that we did, and that just kind of stayed the way it is. I still think in the future it would be cleaner and more efficient to go through and say zoning districts have use tables, and if something is going to be different, then it's a different zoning district um, than it is to kind of um, play, play the games like that because it started to get – starts to look like you're playing favorites on things. So it is it is possible there is a precedent that says you can. I would probably say we'd be better not um, doing that, but it is possible. I mean, as far as solving the issue in front of us, it seems like a really great solution, but I, I do relate with what you're saying, Mike, about the cleanliness of, of regulations. Yeah, you could put a footnote in that would say warehouse condition, um, warehouse self store, conditional use, and with a footnote that says only in Route Two. Do you want me to show you how big the Route Two neighborhood is so that we see what that is? Sure. Do you need? Do I need to? Oh, you can share a screen yourself, right? Yep. So, can you see? Yes, map? we're zoomed in so on stone cutters. Yeah. Everything here in blue is the Route 2 neighborhood. It's a subset of the riverfront. So it starts here at the edge of the parcel section we were talking about changing the zone neighborhood and covers so all of this bottom, this little chunk here of Stevens Pasture, everything through here, past Granite Street. Um, and then it stays here on Long Stonecutter's Way and then stops partway down Stonecutter's Way.
I mean, I'm not, I'm not personally afraid of like storage units being thrown up everywhere. So I'm, I'm not too concerned about the, the size of it. Although, I mean, it's a pretty big neighborhood. What's up, Barb? Did you call on me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I am concerned about how big that and the potential uses for the riverfront district. Um, and opening it up to self-storage units anywhere along that neighborhood, I think would be a mistake. Um, in terms of thinking about a surgical change, and I know Mike's not gonna like this, um, <laughs> given the fact that we just looked at that parcel and one part of it, is, it that it is subdivided by the railroad, we, um, is it possible to um, rezone uh, to keep the lower part, or? the part that's closer to the river, in the riverfront, and the part that actually fronts on Route 2 into um, Eastern Gateway, since it already has a lot of automotive type uses. But that would take one parcel and split it uh, into two zones, which I know Mike does not favor. Well, it's subdivided so by the railroad, so it's it, it can be a clean, a clean line. Is there because anything on the other side of the railroad, though. Yes, that's where yes. a number of the buildings and a number of the self-store units are. Um, that's where the the growler is. That's where. Um, oh, thank you. The insurance company is. Yeah, there you go. That's the aerial photo. So you can see all those little lines. The little white lines, those are all the self-store units that are on the north side of the railroad tracks. And then as you get closer to Pioneer Street, you've got a couple of actual businesses, um, the insurance company and um, the growler and the um, marijuana dispensary? dispensary building. Yeah, dispensary building. And then south of the railroad tracks, you have the, the trading post building, which is the large, large structure. There's the vacant parking lot that, they've, um, that, that they're looking to propose to put something in. And then there's the gas station with, or the car wash, which is owned separately. The, the reason I'm asking this is that I walked down the bike path on the opposite side of the river to sort of get a sense of the backside of that property. Um, and yes, it is in use now, but as for self storage and other uses, but it might not be in the future. And it's, it is potentially a really opportune location as Kirby pointed out before walking distance to town and, um, certainly beautiful views from there. So in the future, if Mr. Barrett was to sell this property, then it could be developed as res as residential or any of the other uses allowed in in Riverfront. Kirby, can I make a comment? Okay. I just wanted to also, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of this in terms of our priorities that we've just started talking about with regard to the plan and um, housing is one of them and you know good locations for housing is one of them i'm not a developer so i'm not positive that you know with the railroad going through and the size and you know that this is ideal for that however um we've the city is making you know investments in um the bike path that's going out that way it feels like it could be a really accessible and mixed use area and then if Sabin's pasture is also our other area for development in the future this could all be um how like residential areas that are sort of mixed use and it could I'm also trying to think through an equity lens um and this would could give us space to put you know people in in better just better kind of it's it's far from farther from downtown, but you know if you're thinking about chunks of space where we have, you know that can be connected somehow to downtown. This is really the chunk, this whole area out here, and um, I think there's a lot of potential for 
different uses going into the future. I mean, I, I recognize that, I recognize that, you know, what, that it's not that now and it's complicated a little bit, but I feel like our values right now are trying to get us towards that, um, you know, more housing, more equitable housing, more affordable housing. And this is that zone for it. That's where I'm at right now. And I, can I just respond to, to some of the points that were made? Would that be okay? Yeah, go ahead. I understand that, but you know what? I feel almost like we're getting reverse spot zoned here. Now, I, you know, coming in here and trying to explain the reality of the situation, I didn't want to go into too much detail because I felt like that was making an argument for spot zoning. But when I hear, well, we want this property in the future for people to walk around and enjoy the river or whatever it is that other people have the notion of, you know, and I get zoning's about the future, but here's the thing. This is a property that has been invested in. Not, you know, the city of Montpelier is not the only entity that has invested money here. The Barretts have invested money over 50 years in this property. They took out an 80,000 gallon or filled in an 80,000 gallon underground storage tank and took massive, nasty industrial structures off that property. They've improved it tremendously. And it's a little bit hard to reconcile all of that hard work investment in a three generations of a family business that will continue into the future to hear about, well, we want this turned into something different. That's not going to happen, even if the zoning change remains. And it's distressing at times to hear. I mean, these are great plans, and I understand all of that, but this isn't going to change for another 50 years. And the absurdity of this change is troubling because it feels um, like it's not recognizing all of the decades that this family has contributed to the Montpelier City um, the taxes that have been paid on these buildings and on the businesses and everything else. So it's, I implore you to try to help us find a solution here. The um, idea of making the back part, keeping that riverfront and allowing that parking lot or that area that's adjacent to route to the actual highway, um, make that Eastern Gateway, that would be great. We, we could live with that. That would allow that one parking lot area to be, um, you know, to continue the mini storage building there. And that would complete, you know, their, their development of this property consistent with the plans that they've had for many years. Um, so I, I'm, I'm begging you to help these folks here because I think they kind of got this is an unintended consequence. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's like we want this, um, you know, to be a riverfront and people to walk on it from now on in the future. But that's not what the investment has been. And uh, can, I, can I offer a couple of clarifications to, to hopefully assuage some concerns? Um, one thing is that, you know, we're having this discussion right now because of our recognition and, and, um, the investment in the property and the, the importance of the business to the community because I mean really we just went through very recently an entire zoning overhaul in which it was decided that uh, you know this this area was best used as mixed use going forward and we're already reconsidering that you know out of respect for the property owners and everything so so I hope you do realize that I mean I do Thank think you. we um, we do we do a Thank lot of you. I think a lot of planning commissions would have probably said no it's not worth our time and moved on or something but no we definitely want to work and we and we're still trying to do that the other thing is I want to make a clarification about Marcella mentioned the bike path and I, there might have been some miscommunication there where you thought that the bike path or had to do with like community access or com or like some something to do with like how it's good for the community and we want this property to somehow contribute to the community directly in that way. What she meant was, and I think, because it's this, my thoughts on it, um, and Marcella, correct me if I'm wrong uh, about your thoughts on it, but the bike path 
the, the presence of the bike path means that this parcel is that much more connected to the downtown. So it's a, it's a matter of being connected. It's not a matter of wanting the community or the public to use the parcel or benefit from it. So I hope, hope you understand that. It's about you said infrastructure connected that uh, connection. Uh, what's Thank up, Mark? Thank you. That's helpful. I, I wasn't understanding what you what you was talking about. So, and I don't mean any disrespect. It's just very frustrating to be in this circumstance, and we do appreciate your taking up this matter. We're just really hopeful um, that we can find a solution that that helps uh, that makes sense for everybody. I, I don't mean to say you have to fix it for these people. That's not what zoning is about, and I get that. What's up, Barb? Yeah, so um, I think there are some. Uh, there is a little bit more confusion. I mean, the bike path is obviously on the other side of the river. So, but the bike path makes that lower portion of the property much more visible and and uh, potentially appealing. Um, in answer to something Marcella said, um, the although the railroad easement is through there, the railroad no longer goes through there. It's it was relocated to the other side of the river. Is that correct, Mike? That the railroad is the railroad is still active on, but they're building, they're reactivating the far, the one on the other side of the river right now. They're rebuilding that. They haven't said what they're going to do with this side yet. So currently, both sides are active rail lines. Because, but they they aren't running any anything on it, right? And they're uh, the problem with the, the Barrett side is that the uh, the trestles, as I understand it that um, they would have to do a lot more work, in other words, to make that a usable portion of the railroad. So it's possible that, although it provides a boundary line, it splits the parcel, it's not actually likely to be an active railroad. And I don't know, I can't, I can't answer where that's at at that point. The issue they're having is that those bridges are not gonna be sufficient to continue to run granite over them. Whether they'll be sufficient for some other use will be another question. And, I, mm -hmm. and that's a question for the state railroad who has been very tight lipped about, in fact, they didn't even tell us they were going to replace that rail line until they showed up and started tearing it up. So we just, uh, we're, we're waiting um, to see what the plan is for this side of the railroad. Is it something they're going to throw up that the city can take and connect to our bike path? Because it does connect to our bike path, in which case, you could use the railroad bridges as bike bridges, but we don't know that. Um, but at this point, it's still still considered an active rail on this side. Well, I guess, it, I mean, it appears that the property, this, the portion of the property towards the river has already been fully developed. And Mr. Barrett, you don't have any intention of adding more buildings along the river um between the railroad easement and and the river do you no right yes yeah. there's no so, available right right yeah so it's pretty built out um yeah. so i am um, i guess this is that's my argument for for dividing it um so so mike what do you think what what's a plausible surgical approach um Barb's approach wouldn't be wouldn't be bad, and I have less concerns over the 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 spot zoning concerns that you have. Um, of course, lawyers can always see things different. I'm not a lawyer, but um, it generally comes down to you want to treat similar properties in similar conditions in a similar way. And what spot zoning sometimes does illegally is provide somebody with unique benefits or unique harms, um, even though they're very similar to their neighbors. And I think in this case, it's, it's a property that is uniquely different than its surrounding properties, if you were to look across the river or across the street. Um, and where it does match is to one of its boundaries. So it's not going to be carved out as a unique use. It's simply going to be moving a line from the the 
eastern side of the property to the western side of the property and saying we're just going to move this shift this line over um so uh, I'll, I'll clarify real quickly because I, I never elaborated on what exactly my spot zoning concern was but uh it's the element of spot zoning where you change zoning where you're at odds with your city plan just to benefit a parcel like that part that kind of concept related to spot zoning um and so so that would be my concern but that said um you know, I don't think it's enough of a concern to, you know, totally preclude us from trying to address the issue here. Uh, but, but, but just, just for the record, I mean, my concern was that I think that if we were to change it to Eastern Gateway, I do think that that's at odds with our other efforts as far as making a walkable downtown and some of the other stuff that we've discussed. Um, so it could be argued that that that's why it would be spot zoning. But it, you know, I'm not saying that's definite at all. But, but go, go on, Mike, about, about solutions. Oh, so, I mean, I think Barb's solution, you know, would be, would be the most surgical solution because we would then be keeping the area that's north of the railroad in Riverfront where if there was a future redevelopment, that would be, you know, more tied into, you know, not having car dealership down there or not having more car washes down there. Um, those areas would have to be consistent with the, the riverfront district if we kept it in riverfront down there. They would be non-conforming, but that's not an issue. Nothing says non-conforming can't remain. They're grandfathered as, as been protected under state law. Um, so that would be fine. And then above that, we would adjust to be more um, oriented towards the road because Frankly, that's their only access. There is no sidewalk on that side. Um, they are more auto-oriented already. Car wash. Um, so if you're looking for surgical, that would probably be the most surgical change. Um, and as you said, so we've kind of got three, three proposals. We can change the whole thing according to what was printed. We can do Barb's surgical, or we could just change the zoning to allow the use in the river, a riverfront district, and and maybe surgically attaching that in as which was your proposal, Kirby. So I think there are a couple of couple of ways of addressing this, um, or not making a change. I mean, I guess that's always an option out there that would not benefit the Barretts, but is always an option. What do other people think about those options, uh, Aaron uh, and and Aaron? Either of you guys. Uh, I'm sort of thinking about uh, the idea, I'm trying to tease this out in my brain a little bit, um, the notion of maybe making conditional use within the Riverfront District for the establishment of uh, storage units, I feel like that gets around the spot zoning concern and also, you know, puts some guardrails on, you know, further development within the Riverfront District, I tend to share sort of the broader concerns about unintended consequences of expanding the Eastern Gateway into that parcel. Just given the expansion of the bike, you know, the, the bike corridor, um, I feel like development trends going out east of the city, I think are going to accelerate. Um, and I don't know what that's going to look like in 20 years. And so I do think there should be some caution about, you know, just sort of allowing the Eastern Gateway uh, zoning to take hold in that parcel. But I think a conditional use for uh, storage units on this parcel, I think, takes care of the problem. Um, I'm just trying to... I, I, there's probably something I'm not thinking about, but that's kind of what I'm batting around in my head. So that's kind of leaning on Kirby's idea. Um, yeah, thanks for Aaron. Um, Arianne, do you have anything? Yeah, I probably um, would be, would probably favor that proposal too, I think. Um, understanding that it, I guess the conditional use would expand to that whole zoning district, but it's still a conditional use. So 
there's some protections there. I don't think other people are going to do self storage units in that district, but yeah, I probably would favor that approach. And I'll also tack on, I, I do think that this prop, this parcel has some pretty unique features uh, which differentiate itself from the other uh, sort of properties within the Riverfront District that I think would help us recognize that, you know, a, a storage unit is probably appropriate in that spot, but probably not in some other places within the district. Okay. Uh, Barb, what do you have to say? Yeah, I agree with Aaron that there are, um, that particular parcel has some very distinct characteristics, one of which is the topography is such that it really divides the property into two u two different zones, one of which is visible from Route 2 and the other one is visible from the river. I would be very, I, as I said before, I'd be concerned about um, adding the use of uh, self-storage units to the riverfront district just because that is very much in con uh, basically in conflict with what we said that our, our land use goals were, which was to develop the riverfront as a people space, whether it's residential or some other use, but not, not self-storage to me would not do that. And so it really seems that we're opening Pandora's box, if you will, that um, to allow that in the riverfront district. Yeah, thanks, Barb. I mean, it sounds like, yeah, we with different different levels of concern for slightly different things. I mean, I think we're all concerned about some aspects of this. Uh, Marcella, did you have anything else? Or we? I don't, I don't think so. I think what I said, and I'm kind of agreeing with what everyone else is wrestling with. Okay. Uh, so based on what Aaron and Ariane just said, uh, it sounds like there's some interest in um, a proposal to amend to to uh, to am, to amend the uh, permitted uses in zoning district four three uh, to include a permitted use of um, conditional use. A, a conditional. A use. Thank you. Thank you. I thought I was saying conditional in my head. I'm glad you corrected that. Wow. Wait, four three. Are you talking about the riverfront <laughs> district or a neighborhood? It was the route to neighborhood is my understanding is what we're talking about. Not not the entire district, but just for the four three neighborhood. Is that my understanding? Yes, that's what I'm thinking about. Is, was that your understanding, Mike, in terms of what we were discussing? Yes. So we would be doing something similar to what we did with Gasoline Alley? Yes. I see. It would be Storage Unit Alley. Got it. Oh. But Barb, <laughs> yours, Barb your, you, does your concern still stand about that being a Pandora's box? Absolutely, yeah, because there, there are a lot of other prime um, sites along the river in that neighborhood that potentially could be dedicated to other uses. And in the future, you know, the, the riverfront of this parcel, 100 years from now or however long it is, could be dedicated to other uses as well. Um, so I think, um, I think that's just contrary to what we said we've been wanting to do, wanting to encourage in terms of housing in or any other uses in our downtown. I'm kind of agreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you on that. I mean, for me, it's, you know, we have to, you have to make a concession one way or the other. If, if you're talking about the, the two proposals of either expanding the Eastern Gateway somewhat or creating this new conditional use, the new conditional use is very specific to one use. The expanding the Eastern Gateway in any way creates new, like a whole menu of industrial uses that are possible. So that's why I think it's more likely because there's so many different uses that would be allowed. Uh, it, I think the chances of something that, you're, that we're not expecting right now to happen is greater 
by opening that large of a, of a, of a, a door. Um, I think that there is a certain supply and demand when it comes to the storage units. It seems like that's seems to me like that's being met because there's about to be some new ones. It would seem, um, in addition to what's already there. So I don't, I, I'm not, I don't know, but, but I mean, you could be right. There, there could be other ones in, and that's the thing about this. We don't know. Go ahead, Barb. But I'm, I'm missing out on, I don't, uh, I don't favor either one of the two alternatives that you just suggested. The third alternative being to rezone, to, to move the line um, for the riverfront off of Route 2 and move it to the, the railroad railroad easement. Yeah, but I mean, my understanding was that, that most of the parcel would still be... Uh, would still be Eastern Gateway in that case, right? The I mean, upper portion of it, the upper portion that's that's accessible off of Route Two, could potentially be Eastern Gateway. Yeah. So that's why I was comparing, like, what kind of what kind of Pandora's box comes with extending Eastern Gateway in that way. But there's only one parcel in there then, which is the parcel that Mr. Barrett w wants to develop that has no development along it. I thought there were at least three developments there that would be included. Yes, there's, well, there's, it's one, it's two parcels that could be subdivided. They could subdivide um, along the access way. And then you'd have the trading post and then you'd have the vacant lot. I think getting to Kirby's, so just, just to throw a little bit in, in each each bucket of, of ideas. So one thing, you know, as Kirby was pointing out, if we were to shift these to Eastern Gateway, then today as Riverfront, you cannot build a gas station. But if this were Eastern Gateway, it could be a gas station or it could be some other heavier industrial use. Um, so that's, you know, kind of, I think one possibility that, that I don't think we would want to see here, but, um, looking the other way, the concern about this, the, perhaps the spread of self store units, if it remains in riverfront, certain other standards continue to apply, including, you know, a requirement that buildings have a 24 foot height um, that initially was a requirement to have two stories um, but it was kind of recognized that you could go through like um, Caledonia Spirits did a mezzanine they have a large opening so that was why they because otherwise a two-story building would require an elevator and they didn't want a, the expense of an elevator so I, I don't think a lot of people in Riverfront would be taking advantage of building self-store units. If if it happens, it's probably going to be a part of something else. Um, somebody may take advantage of that use. I can think um, uh, if you go around Pioneer Street and go around the corner, there's the um, I want to say SC Services. Um, the um, yeah. The services building, which has a whole bunch of bays that, that they currently use for uh, carpeting and and sales and stuff like that, they could lease out a you know a garage, which is would essentially just be a self store unit. Um, it's not really building self store units because they really couldn't. Most of that area is built out. Um, it would still be a conditional use. So if it was inconsistent with the neighborhood, it could be denied. I mean, that's, that's the basis of conditional use review is that it's going to be looked at. Um, it's not definite that yes, otherwise it would be a permitted use. It's a, it, it depends on the context in which it is proposed. If there's a structure, all new structures in Riverfront have to have that 24 foot minimum height. So that would be the one consequence that, um, the Barretts would have to look at is architecturally, they would have to design their, their new self store units to have um, a look, it has to have that 24 foot um, two story look to it. It has to present as a two story building um, 
or they could make it a two-story building um, and and have two levels. Um, that would be something they would have to address if they remained in, in Riverfront. And that would be true of anyone else who wants to do um, to do self-store units in that district. Um, I guess that's what I throw. Would, would Mr. Barrett or, or Brooke uh, like to comment on, on that? Does that change um, how you feel about the, the different possibilities we're discussing? I don't know how you do a two-story self-storage unit. <laughs> and I would argue if you put it as a, an allowed use or, or conditional use, I, I would suggest that that architectural component not apply because I don't know how you do that. Um, unless you want to build some fake facade or something and pretend it's a two-story building. Um, but again, I go back to to Barbara's, uh, I don't mean to call you by your first name, I can't read, Ms. Conray's, um, her idea I think is the least invasive or, or the minimal change. We had not thought about that before. Um, I understand the concern about the, uh, the large area distribution or transit warehouse. Um, that couldn't happen with the existing space that's there, uh, that's undeveloped. I suppose the trading post at some point could be removed or turned into a warehouse if someone wanted to. So I understand those issues. I think they're very unlikely. And then heavy manufacturing as well. I don't think you have the space for it. Um, but again, I'm trying to step back from it and look at it as a zoning and not a spot zoning situation where I think having that demarcation of the rail line makes a lot of sense because that keeps all the automotive stuff away from the river, which you don't want it down there. And you already have the car wash in that area that's uh, on our on the road side of the um, of the rail line, I think that's the least problematic for you folks. You, I would not recommend, though. Uh, certainly, we wanted if that's the only way to get it is to add this uh, conditional use to Riverfront. Um, but just because you don't know of who wants to do what who's in Riverfront today, that's sort of the problem that that we're experiencing. Nothing is forever. I think that's a can of worms. I really do. I think Barbara's idea of splitting it allows you to protect the riverfront back portion while acknowledging the front portion and the use of it right now would be compliant with Eastern Gateway. And you're really only talking about that one parking lot area, which is big enough for a self-storage building, not a major manufacturing plant. Those are my thoughts on it. And I'm being as honest and straightforward with you. Uh, I probably should say do any of them, but I think um, the splitting of the lot is the, the best choice for the city. They all accomplish what my client needs, but except for this two story thing, which is kind of weird. I don't know how to deal with that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Brother. I think, I think we're, we're running low on time. So if, if, if you guys would, let's go ahead. And um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm torn about how to approach doing a vote here. I think maybe what we could do is a straw poll to see um, how much support each idea has and maybe go from there uh, about a vote. So, well, I'm, can, I ask a yeah. procedural, can I ask a procedural question first? Yeah. Uh, this public hearing was noticed uh, for a potential zoning change that would require the movement of the boundary um, from the Eastern District over to the West. If we do any, if we are considering anything outside of that, that change, can we, can we do that here? It's a good or question. Do have, or do we have to re-notice this? What do you think, Mike? Pretty sure you're okay. I think we just have to reflect the changes in that required report that I put together. But if you want to keep talking, I will read 4441 really quick and 
make sure we're okay. <laughs> okay, that sounds like a good use of time. Okay, so straw poll. Um, I'm going to start with what seems like the two most popular uh, possibilities, and that's the condition. Uh, what I'm going to call the conditional use in District Four Three approach, and the other one being the split the parcel and expand Eastern Gateway approach. Um, not to be confused with a full expansion of Eastern Gateway, but uh, okay. So, so first I'll say, just raise your hand, please, if you would be supportive, if you would vote for uh, the conditional use in the District 4-3 approach. And keep your hands up for a second and let me, okay, uh, let's just see what kind of support that has. Um, Aaron, do you have your hand up? I do. Okay. <laughs> So that looks like we've got three on that one. We have Marcella flipping. Okay, so uh, what about the split the parcel and expand the Eastern Gateway? You may be surprised that I would be willing to vote for that. Uh, Aaron, do you have your hand up for this one? Uh, I, I think it's an interesting idea. I, I'm not ready to vote for it now, but I'll okay. take a little more. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not outright opposed to it, but right now I don't know enough. I have to think about it. Well, okay, so we, we do have a bit of a problem then, because it seems like we only have three supporters for each idea, and we need four for a majority. Um, so can we just discuss it at the next meeting? Um, is that would that be valuable? Are we do we need more of a planning commission members to be with us to discuss it? If we if we can't get anyone on board with either idea who's currently not, um, then I will I guess we'll have to table it. Yeah, I guess just to speak. I mean. I guess I am concerned about after, you know, talking through it, it moving the Eastern Gateway to that, that parcel and potentially allowing gas stations. And I thought, Marcella, you mentioned that that actually would be, the upper parcel would even be like the, the better potential parcel in terms of views. And I mean, you know, not that views are everything, but I just, I guess I'm uncomfortable with at this point anyway. Um, just expanding the Eastern Gateway, given those other uses, even on that upper parcel. What, can I just ask a question? Oops, am I muted? Can I ask a question about the, the concerns for those other automobile things? Is that, um, I, I don't understand. Um, I mean, first of all, it's not planned, but you can't ever plan on that. But what would be the issue there exactly? Is it out that, I guess I'm not sure what question I'm really asking. The potential for, if you allowed that to, that top portion be Eastern Gateway, would allow automobile sales or rental establishment that is not currently allowed but automobile repair and service is allowed in both districts. So if you're talking about, you don't want a service station there, it can be there anyway today. So I don't think that now, can they have one new, uh, you know, sales place, a, a lot to sell cars? No. So the automobile issues, I think maybe um, a little bit more refined they're not as i don't want that to be a, a reason to stand in the way of doing this when it can be done now i guess is the point i'm trying to make my understanding is that, well mike can answer better than me but I, my understanding is a, a like an auto mechanic can can be there now but not a gas station is that right yes that that's one of the and, you know, and the heavy industry. So that would be, I was just trying to point out some of the points that Kirby had made on the, the difference on the use table between Eastern Gateway and Riverfront. Shifting to Eastern Gateway makes a lot of things possible that may be negative, 
but at the same time, you know, it's a smaller parcel that many of these things may not be appropriately that, that they'll end up being located here. Um, and as a conditional use, maybe they would be denied, but I think the gas station was a permitted use. Uh, I'm sorry, Mike, I'm not looking at, I don't see that on the zoning um, chart that you, that you sent. I'm confused. Where is gasoline station that allows it in that district? My chart doesn't have anything that refers to a gas station. Uh, it's it's on the first page to two dash thirty three. It's called fueling station. And in Eastern Gateway, it's a permitted use. And in Riverfront, it's only allowed in Gasoline Alley or the crossroads. Um, oh, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't have that page of it. Okay, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's not a lot of differences. A lot of them are just a difference between one is conditional and one's permitted. Um, but Kirby was pointing out that there are some uses that aren't allowed at all today that if we shifted to Eastern Gateway would now be allowed, mini warehouse being one, but also, you know, tank farms, large distribution warehouses, heavy industry or heavy manufacturing. Um, Right, but if you as unlikely as they would be, they they would be now potential uses. Right, but if you agreed with Barbara's proposal, you're you don't even have a potential. Even if they took the trading post down, you don't have the potential for those heavy industry or big tank farms because there isn't enough property between the railroad and the and the street. So I think. I think you have a protection because it's limited physically. Follow me? Yes, and there are a number of them that are also conditional uses. And as we were talking about adding the that use to Riverfront, the same would apply here. Those those heavy manufacturing that are conditional uses would also have to meet the conditional use standards, which may mean that they would be denied in this case because while it may be appropriate over on Gallison Hill, it may not be appropriate here on Pioneer Street. Okay, so we're about to run out of time. Um, so I'll um, just ask the Planning Commission again, uh, just, just to see if we could get this done tonight. Is anyone who didn't raise their hand for something before, are you willing to support an idea? Um, that you didn't raise your hand for? Okay. And just so you know, Brooke and um, Mr. Barrett, the, the, we, are, we're, we have two planning commission members who are not here today. So that's why we've, they, they have to make four, they have to get to four votes, but being too short has made it a little bit more difficult to get to the four votes. It's three votes for one option, three votes for the other option. Um, and if we were to table this to the next meeting, the expectation is that we can get the other two people. And if they support one or the other, if at least one of them supports one or the other, then this can move forward. And I yeah. think that may be where we're heading. There, there are nine members total? Seven members. Oh, seven members. So you need four. Yeah, and we only party. have we only have five here tonight. So the, the having only five here tonight meant we had to get four people to agree on the same four out of the five to agree on the same answer. And we got three to agree to one and three to agree to the other because Kirby has is willing to support either of the options. Mm -hmm. So just so that I'm I'm understanding, the first option was just to add um, to Riverfront a conditional use for the uh, Riverfront, keep it zoned as it is, but just to add that as a conditional use. Mike, I just have one quick question. 
some of these uh, conditional uses on these charts have like little numbers by them, like an exponent. Is there anything that can be con like already conditioned or are these C the conditional use demarcations on these uh, charts? Is there some restriction? What is this like C and then the exponent three mean? Uh, some of them depend on, uh, there, there are footnotes that are at the end. Some of them will go and say the use can't occupy more than 20,000 square feet or the use cannot occupy more than, um, you know, the, the, the limit is to maximum of 20 guests. So there's a, a limit to, um, it's allowed, but it's a limited allowance. Um, number three says it's allowed only in the crossroads district. And that's what they were going to propose was that many warehouses would be allowed, but only in the route two neighborhood was the proposal. So, so, yeah, so, so to clarify, Brooke, yeah, it, it, it's not the entire riverfront. That idea is to allow a conditional use for the riverfront portion that's in District 43 only. And District 43 is the same as saying the Route 2 district. The Route, okay, I understand. All right. And, then and the, can addition, can there be like an additional restriction that says, and you can only have like no more than two buildings or, you know, something like that to give you folks that that comfort that you won't have these things proliferating in the Route 2 portion of the riverfront? I'm just finding a, trying to find a way to a resolution that would satisfy you folks. I don't know, maybe crazy idea. Yeah, I mean, I think the riverfront district still presents a problem for you in that it does have the 24 foot minimum height. Um, so I think yeah, that's true. I forgot. Okay. Um, Unless we included that in our footnote. Unless we included a not having the 24 foot height, Kirby, is that what you're suggesting? Uh, yeah, unless we include a different height. Oh. Mike, if we were to table this discussion and get back to it at the next meeting, do we have to uh, re-notice the public hearing? Or we, have, we uh, sat have we satisfied our public hearing obligation? On no, if, you, if you voted to continue the hearing to the next meeting, then the hearing has been warned and it's been noticed. And it would, uh, the, the table would, the, the, the meeting would simply continue at the next date certain. And to answer the earlier question that, that was presented, you can make changes. The Planning Commission may make revisions to a proposed bylaw amendment or repeal um, and to the written report, which is what I would have to do, and then submit to the, the proposed bylaw to the legislative body. So you can make revisions, including substantial revisions. And this has happened a lot, even in the, even when it's gotten to city council, which Kirby probably remembers, we got to city council and it was getting changed sometimes dramatically. Barb would remember too. She was she was there for that when when we went through the adoption that some some portions changed rather quickly and rather dramatically. Yeah. Well, it, it looks like we're out of time, so it looks like we will have to table this. Uh, and and Mike, will, will it be a problem for us to pick it up next time? Is that enough time to warn it? Uh, we don't have to rewarn the hearing. Okay. Because it's going to be as long as there's a motion to continue the hearing to. Okay, thanks. So, do we have a motion to continue? July 27th. Do we have a motion to continue the hearing to July 27th? We do. Okay, moved by Aaron. Do we have a second? A second. Second by Marcella. Okay. All in favor of. Sorry, Barb. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> I'm sure Barb got um, the race hurt. to unmute, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor of um, moving this, you know, the portion of the hearing, of course, having to do with the uh, zoning change with Pioneer Street only uh, to July 27. Uh, those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So we will pick up this hearing.
on July 27, uh, we will let the other planning commissioners know that, that we may need them to come in and be the deciding votes to be our Justice Kennedy. Okay. All right, with that, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Okay, second? I'll second. Okay, Barb got in that time. Uh, those in favor of adjourning, say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Okay, we are adjourned, and we'll see you guys at 27. Thank you Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, you folks, for all your time. <laughs>